Hi guys, I am so excited about today's podcast. I have a book coming out. It's a kid's book. It's called My First Book of Earth. You can actually pre-order it right now, but it um, is available for sale where books are sold July 12th. And I have been talking about it a lot on Instagram, and people have been asking me, how did this come about? How did I, how did I get the opportunity to write a kid's book? So today I am going into detail about that, talking about my experience setting it up and actually writing it and getting it published. And then for the second part of the podcast, I'm also gonna tell you about my experience writing my other book, getting a job in wildlife biology, what it's like and what you need to know. I self-published this book in 2020 and it was such a great process and I really hope this this podcast inspires you to write a book. This is something you all can do so I'm going to break it down for you and talk also about the advantages of working with a publisher and self-publishing. So let's get right into it. Hi guys, so before we jump into this podcast, if you're watching me on YouTube, you can tell I'm not in my normal setting. I'm traveling right now, so I'm at somebody else's house, and I have this cute black Labrador Retriever here who is very playful. So you may hear some noises or um, squeaky toys, things like that, so just so you know, um, that's what's going on. and. I, like I said in the introduction, I am so excited to talk about this topic of writing my first kid's book. It was always a dream of mine to write a kid's book, and I did not know how to go about it. Even having written a book for, um, for teenagers and adults, um, with my getting a job in wildlife biology book, I still didn't really know how to approach a kid's book. So when I got this opportunity, I knew I had to pounce on it and I am so grateful for it. I am so happy that it happened. So here's, here's how it works. I was invited by a publishing company to potentially be an author for a book. And this was actually last year, it was for a book about nature. So what I did is, um, or they, they asked me to do, include a writing sample, so they gave me a bunch of, um, of like prompts, so and this was actually from the book. So, so if they selected me, they could actually use that text already, but they give you different prompts, so they have different page layouts, and they give you a topic. So one topic might be insects. I might have you write about insects for um, a page or another or two pages. And you're given a word limit and they give you the, the main points that they want you to talk about. So I think I had to do, maybe I had to write maybe four pages. And um, you submit it and then you're told if you're, you got the opportunity or not. So the, the first book, like I said, it was a nature book. I was so excited because, you know, nature is really my thing. Unfortunately, though, I didn't get that. But they approached me again to write this book about Earth. And I, again, was so excited for the opportunity. And my background is more in nature and not as, and not as much as like the earth sciences. So um, when I got it, I was, I was so surprised, but also so happy to have been given this opportunity. I don't know how they found me um, to begin with, but I want to say like just in general to put yourself out there. And it's opportunities or it's, or it's things like this that I'm doing right now on YouTube, on this podcast, that people find me. So if you're at all interested in doing anything more creative, then, then put yourself out there. Put yourself out on social media, on um, YouTube, create your own videos, because it's a great way for people to find you. And this is true for the TV world too. So I am on some TV shows. I'm a regular on the Science Channel's What on Earth, and now I'm a regular on the History Channel's new show called The Proof is Out There. And even though 
I had been on the Science Channel, the the people from the proof is out there, the producers, they actually found me from one of my YouTube videos. So it wasn't about networking, it wasn't about connection, it wasn't about seeing me on a different show. It was all about me just putting myself out there. And I also want to encourage you guys to not be so perfectionistic. For the longest time with a YouTube channel, I thought it had to be these, these really sophisticated videos. I worked at a museum and we had an AV department and we would create pro promotional videos for our research when new projects came out or when new papers came out and they were really slick. It had a lot of like video editing and for me with this channel what's really important and this is what people care about sorry the, the lab is is going after an insect it's cute um so this is what people care about most is content over quality so that's where i started like yes of course i want to communicate and have high quality videos and and audio but there's only so much time in a day there's only so much you can do so I prioritize, prioritize content, and in the video that I was um, discovered in for the History Channel, it's just me, like talking, it's a talking head video of just me talking about um, Black Panthers and how we know if they're really there or not. So if you know something about a topic, definitely make a video and put it out there, and consistency is key. So I'm not sure how they found me, but I, I have like writings, I have a blog with lots of blog posts, I have a YouTube channel, but they contacted me and I got the book. So yay, I was so excited. And they decide the topic, so, so kind of like how the, the sample writing was, that's really how the whole book is laid out. So every single page was laid out for me in terms of what I needed to write and the things that I needed to cover. And they choose these topics because they're, they're looking for books that, um, that either, like it's kind of missing in, in the market, so they do keyword research, uh, research for, for different topics, or that it's a topic that is covered, but maybe it's not as scientifically accurate, like there's not as, as, as strong science-based books out there. So this book was intended for an audience of three to five year olds and I do work with kids. I've worked with middle school kids especially and as young as I'd say like fourth grade. So that's that's most of my experience. So this was a different audience for me. This was a lot younger than I was used to. And you are breaking down really challenging topics like plate tectonics and air pressure, how weather is made, um, how continents are formed, I guess that has to do with plate tectonics too, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, just really broad topics like the ocean and, and even just like where earth is in the sun and you have to think about how three to five year olds think. Like they don't understand gigantic numbers as much. And actually this is really good ad science communication advice for, for for anyone, even adults. Like if we say something is X feet high, it's kind of hard for us to visualize, but if we say something is like 19 houses high or, or school buses long, then it's much easier for us to visualize. So that's actually a really good tip for, for all audiences. And honestly, I've found that to be true, not just that tip, but in general, a lot of the talks that I would make for kids on my research, I use the same talks for adults um, because it's you're, you're distilling the information to the most important parts and communicating it. The word limit was a big challenge. I often had 50 to 100 words to explain these, these difficult topics. And I had to use it with simple language, so we couldn't use any jargon. If we did introduce a more sophisticated science term, we would have to describe it. And some of these terms are really difficult to describe on their own in 100 words or less, let alone combine it with the other topics that we needed to cover for that spread. 
Um, we did have a glossary, so that was really helpful. So the book, it has different um, themes for every different page or two pages. And then at the end, there's a glossary for kids to be able to look up words. Maybe um, they come across and they don't remember or for words that are especially important and that stick out. That part was definitely the most challenging, is taking these really sophisticated concepts that even use sophisticated words in describing the concept and then having to break that down, like I said, to like 50 words or 100 words. And at sometimes I didn't think I could do it, and the other challenge was to be scientifically accurate. You had to use words like like most or usually or can because in science a lot of times there's exceptions to the rules so you have to be scientifically accurate for example when i first started writing about volcanoes i described them kind of using the the most common form that we think about with volcanoes which is the cone shape but volcanoes can actually be in different forms and again, this is so hard to explain over 50 to 100 words. So I had to be very careful with my word choice. And this was a true challenge getting that down. But I really think it helped me as a science communicator. And once I got the hang of it, then then I I did pretty well. So the first, you submit it, in, you submit it to your um, editor in rounds and batches. I would write... I think like 40 pages at a time and then have a deadline for that and submit it and they would give me the revisions and I'd be writing on the other the other next set of pages when when um, they're reviewing that first set and the first revisions I got ba back there were definitely a lot of red marks and that was key I had to be scientifically accurate and and incorporate those words to, to make it more all-encompassing. So that's definitely the challenge with writing for this audience. But like I said, once I started to get the hang of it, I really liked it and really started to understand how to distill these, these key concepts into, into simple words. Using, again, this for three to five-year-olds, this audience. So I really had to focus on using very simple words. We did this all in about a month. The whole book was written in a couple of weeks. I had, I think I had like a week and a half to two weeks for each chunk. And I think there were four chunks. And it was, it was definitely work, but like I said, once I got the hang of it, it was, it was really fun and um, it became a lot easier. Then we had the first set of revisions. We revised that. You received a second set of revisions. And, um, and then from then on there, the revisions, you did receive more revisions, but they were very minimal, more like word choices, a couple of adding things. The other thing I did for the book was also select photos. Um, and, and this was actually a big reason why I didn't think I could write a kid's book or, or kid's book seemed so daunting is because I always had this image of kids' book being more like, like well, fiction-based. And even though I wanted to write books about wildlife or nature, I still thought like I would have to have characters and um, yeah, like create stories around it. So that kind of was a challenge for me and getting someone to illustrate the pictures as well. But writing this book made me realize I didn't need to do that. We used photos from um, places like Shutterstock.com and Alamy.com to find images that really represented what we wanted to portray in the book. So I would submit then several images that they could choose from. They used most of the images. In some cases, they used other images, but that was also really fun. And I was just so happy to learn about this. Like, I, I don't know why it was so hard for me to think about this because as a child, I did read nonfiction books. I remember reading National Geographic books and they would, we had this like one book about like hidden animals and you had to find the animal. It was all about camouflage and how predators hide themselves to hunt and how prey hide themselves to avoid being eaten. 
and I had this one about orcas that I still remember. I remember the page so vividly. It was talking about how much orcas eat, and again, it was using that equivalency example. So rather than saying like they eat, you know, X pounds a day, they they equivalented their prey to hamburgers, and they said, you know, if an orca was eating people food, it would have to eat, I think, like, I don't know, what, hundreds of McDonald's hamburgers or whatever. So I thought that was a really great way, and I remember seeing, like, the graphic of the hamburgers stacked up with the whale. Um, so I have been totally inspired by this process. It was so much fun. This this was something I did work during daytime hours, but this is something you could totally do um, in the night or on the weekends. I was also so grateful for these deadlines because we got it out fast. I did this. I wrote this in February, and the book comes out July twelfth. Like I said, you can pre-order it now. If you could pre-order it, that would be awesome because the the way that um, the system works on Amazon, at least, is the pre-orders like dictate how popular the book is, and then you're um, also allowed to give people the PDF of the copy you pre-order. And then they can write reviews, and the reviews open up earlier than the book. So you can start writing reviews June 28th, while the book is on sale July 12th. So if you have a lot of reviews and a lot of pre-orders, then when people are searching, um, you know, kids' book science or kids' book earth, then your book will likely go to the top or it will be seen as a bestseller. One of the days my book was, was written as a hot new release, so that was super exciting. So if you guys are planning on buying the book, it would be awesome if you could pre-order it to help with that algorithm and, and help the book do really well. In terms of payments, you get a flat fee. Um, I know for some publishing companies you get um, royalties, so for every book they sell you get a percentage. In this case it was a flat fee and I was okay with that because I really wanted the experience of doing this and um, like I mentioned it really is inspiring me to write books in the future and I have self-published with my getting a job in wildlife biology book I know therefore I can do that with having written this kids book that that's an opportunity for me okay before we move on to getting a job in wildlife, wildlife biology I just want to make sure I covered everything um, the only other thing is like they designed it all as well. So like the layout, the the book they designed, I didn't have any control about that. Um, but again, this is also something I can totally do. I don't know if you guys use the know of the program Canva. I love it. It's a graphics design program. It's how I create all of my graphics. It is so easy to use. There's a free version. I use the paid version because you get more images. Um, and if you look at my Instagram, all of my images are created from, from Canva and you can create really amazing images in just a few minutes, literally. Like if my podcast, I have a template, you just switch out the graphic, um, sometimes switch up the colors and, and then I got myself a great graphic. You don't need a, a graphic artist. You can, you can do it all yourself. So that's Canva, C-A-N-V-A dot com. Okay, so let's switch to my book, Getting a Job in Wildlife Biology, and this is one that I self-published in 2020. I'm going to talk to you about how I did that and how the experience differed, and again, hopefully encourage you guys to write a book. I never was planning to write a, a, a print book. I initially thought of this idea as an ebook. And I, at the time, was communicating with, with, with Chris Cloney, um, and he was on my podcast. I'll link to that episode um, below. And he is also really interested in science communication. He has his own, um, his own blog and website. And he was like, why are you writing an ebook? Why not just write a book? And I don't know. I was like, I just never thought about writing a book. And he was like, I think writing a book would just be much like, I guess like just more prestigious, more solid. I mean, I would, I would be an author. Ebook is, they're still great. Um, but, but yeah, like really establishing myself as an author. And originally I didn't think I had enough content to write, an e to write a full book, but I just started working on it. 
at the same time, and I'll tell you how I did it, at the same time I was listening to a lot of entrepreneurial podcasts, there was this one podcast, and actually several of them were talking about it, but there was this one podcast in particular that was talking about self-publishing. And I actually didn't know you could self-publish. I thought you would have to pitch ideas to, um, to, to book agents. And this is what I learned. So I actually took a class in science communication. Um, I just sat in on the class. It was actually even after I graduated with my PhD. But we talked to people who were authors and they talked about the process, about pitching and working with publishers. So that just seemed like a lot of, I mean, it seemed like a lot of work. I couldn't just, you know, like randomly put it out there. I'd have to like really carefully think about it. But on these podcasts, they were talking about self-publishing and they were talking about self-publishing as honestly being better than publishing or working with a publishing company. And this one entrepreneur in particular, he is a big name. It's Pat, it's Pat Flynn. Um, he does, uh, I think his podcast is um, Smart Passive Income. And he was weighing the pros and cons of writing a book by yourself, self-publishing, and working with a publisher. And like I said, he's a big name. He's had many opportunities to work with a publisher. I think for his first month, he maybe did. I can't remember. But he was doing the pros and cons. And honestly, there were a lot more pros to self-publishing. So I was like, oh, cool. This is, you know, this is totally something I could do. So. I started working on that from there on out. The next thing that I did is I was already an organizer of a blogging meetup group. And one of the reasons why I organized this meetup is not only to network with people, but also to learn from people. So I invited, this is how I started this podcast too. I invited an expert in podcasting to come to our meetup. This time I invited an author, somebody who self-published. And she gave us a presentation about how she did it. She answered all of our questions. So from there on, I'm like, okay, I can do this. This is something that is, that is totally doable and I'm going to jump in and do this. I thought of my book as a series of long blog posts. At the time I was blogging a lot um, and you, know, you can write a blog post of 10,000 words. <laughs> doggies here <laughs> um, and so and Pat Flynn helped me with this too is just thinking about it as a series of blog posts so if you have a 10 chapter book that's 10 blog posts what I did next is I outlined the major concepts that I wanted to have in the book and I was flexible about where I put them um, so <laughs> doggies being pushy you now come on so one thing that Pat actually recommends is using post-it notes. I like this idea too. So you write the different chapters or what you think are going to be like the main chapters on post-it notes and you can sort of arrange them in terms of how you want the book to flow. Because sometimes when you're thinking very linear, you can get caught up with like the sequence of things. So the post-it notes allow you to move things around. And I actually... I just started writing chapters. I wrote what was easiest for me. So I think I did have an outline, but I also knew like, okay, I'm gonna write a chapter about the, the, the past of the wildlife field. So like what it used to be like. I know I'm going to write a chapter about the, the present and the future of the field. I know I'm going to write a chapter about the different job types, about the different job workplaces. I knew I was going to write about my own experience as well. So that's how I kind of went about it. Then as an outline more formally developed, I used the Best Self Journal, which I love. Um, and so these are broken down by three months. It's a, it's a journal to help you plan three month goals. The idea is if you have a goal for one year, that's, that's too long and you will kind of like put it off. Like if I have to lose, 40 pounds by next year. If we're where we are in June, it's like, okay, well, I still have six months to do that. But if you have three months, it's long enough to make a goal that is, that is more long-term, but short enough that it gets you moving right away. So I had a series of best self journals 
I thought it was going to take me, I think maybe one or two best self journals, but it ended up taking me, I think maybe one more or three. So a total of like nine months. I had written some of it before, but like really serious. I think it was like nine months really working on doing this. And I broke down the, the three months by what I wanted done. So, you know, a draft. So I would have weeks, I would have to write, um, you know, I'd be, chapter one would be this week, chapter two would be this week. And I broke it down using that best self planner. And um, I also just wrote just to write. Like I, like, I wanted to just like get it out. Um, another, so, so like I didn't worry that much about my first drafts and how bad they were. Another reason why I didn't want to work with a publisher is I didn't want to have to worry about compromising my vision. I really felt like I had this story to tell about myself and advice that I wanted to tell people. And I knew this field better than any publisher and I didn't want any of my messages to get lost. So that's always another thing that I really loved about self-publishing. Once I got the, the drafts done, then I worked on revisions. And again, I outlined it by that three months. When was I gonna have the revised copy done? I maybe did some more revisions, but I definitely sent it to people. I sent it first to somebody for, for proofreading, and I thought I was done at that point. But I also asked some people to read it to see what they think. And this one person I reached out to, she, I think she actually reached out to me, because I, I, I think I was writing about it on Facebook, and she, um, she either wrote books before or she had worked with a lot of authors and she offered to read it. And I was really surprised because I was like, this is a career book, like why would you be interested in reading it? But she actually gave me super helpful advice. And she, she told me the book was too like, like manual, like almost like reading a manual and then I needed to tell more of my story in there. So I actually had to add on chapters and um, that's really what increased the length of my book, although my book is not that long. But I really included a lot more of my personal stories and how I got through my journey or how I got to where I am today. And actually that's the first, I think the first four chapters of my book are, are specifically about me so you can understand my background. I'm really vulnerable, really open about everything. I tell you guys exactly how it happened. Then I think I revised it again and I paid somebody to proofread it so I didn't want to spend any more money. Um, I think it cost, I think I paid 500, no maybe not that much, maybe it was somewhere 250 to 500 for the proofreading and I just didn't want to pay that again. Um, so I had uh, some of my other people who were reading it, I said if you haven't seen any errors let me know and then honestly I just proofread the final versions. Then there's a series of steps that you do with KDP, that's Kindle Direct Publishing, like you have to get a number, you have to register for, um, I think it's called the AISN number. If you want to have your books in the library, there's something you need to do first to, I forgot what that process is, I have it written in my notes though. So. Um, but it's super easy and with, with, with Kindle Direct Publishing, they have um, different, templates so you copy and paste all of your stuff in the templates you can choose what size book you want you can choose if you want color photos um, great black and white photos and it's just I mean it's a little bit tedious at times but it's it's really easy to do and if you're a graduate student or if you've ever written a manuscript or a dissertation honestly writing a book was so much easier than doing this or writing a paper so i found the process to be really easy and fun so kindle dark publishing really guides you through that process for the cover that was also fun i used canva again and i had all these different cover options that had graphics because i thought about the books i own and so many of them had graphics but people were telling me not to use graphics they were telling me to use a picture of myself so I created different options for people, I had them vote on it, and then I chose the one that people resonated with the most. That was my book cover, and you upload that into Kindle Direct Publishing, and then you pretty much choose a date, that was a little scary, and during the pre-order process, um, you encourage people to pre-order. So I, um, if people did pre-order, I, I offered them a free workshop. I think it was the job application workshop at that time. 
they were able to go to it for free. So that was encouraging them to get those pre-orders in. And, um, and yeah, I launched my book. Knowing what I know now, I, I would do a more sophisticated launch process, talking more about my book. So I'm learning a lot with this release of my, um, my first book of Earth because I'm working with a publishing company. So um, we're, we're um, getting people reading the book to make sure those reviews are in there. So it's interesting to learn about that, but there's so many fun things you can do for the launch process. And that's really it. Let me see if I, I, I wrote some notes here, so let me see if I missed anything. Um, no, I don't think I did. Um, and if another thing I was worried about is having mistakes because I did proofread it myself. You can change it all. So I can go, in this day, I can go to KDP and upload a new manuscript. So I did have mistakes. People did point out mistakes. And that was fine. I just fixed them and I thanked them. I said, thank you so much for sending me this. And I just, you know, updated it on KDP and that's that. And it, it was just so cool seeing my book, like in my hands published, like looking like a real book. It was awesome. Therefore, if you have a book idea, go for it. I, now that I know how to write these kids books, I'm definitely going to write more kids books. I have several ideas already planned out and I know how, um, it's not necessarily easy to do, but simple to do and how to structure it. So I am so excited to do this more and more in the future. I have lots of book ideas. If you are inspired, if you're not even inspired, if you're ready to go with your book idea, send me. I'd love to know. Drop in the comments what you would love to write a book about. Even if you're not still not sure about doing it, I would love to hear your book ideas. And one thing I also want to say is the world really needs our stories. So many of these books are not written by people who have strong scientific knowledge. I actually um, did this kids program that I put on hold. It's about getting kids outside, getting them connected to wildlife. And it was, it's, it's meant to be um, an add-on to science, the science classroom, but it could, it honestly could be a replacement because I was looking at the standards and aligning it with them. And I was at the time in this, this mastermind group with somebody who homeschooled their kids. And she was telling me about how difficult it was to find good science content that, um, that is not religious based. So there's so much opportunity for us and don't overthink it. Get yourself out there. My book is still doing well this day. I think last year I made four or $5,000 off of, off of the book from people finding it. Again, if you, if you've read my book, I would be so eternally grateful for you and give you, I'd send you so many positive and good vibes for your whole entire life. If you leave an Amazon review, even if you leave a negative review, it still helps. It still helps the algorithm. I actually did get my first one star review. I looked at it to see what people wrote, but they didn't write anything. It was just a one, one star review. And at first I was like, oh my gosh, like that's, that's horrible. And like, I don't know, I got this like awful feeling inside, but then cause I've worked so much on reframing my brain to positive things. I was like, okay, this is good. This makes me, this makes me look, this book look like a legit book because if you go to any popular book, any, any popular place, you will see some bad reviews. Whereas if, if you just like only see five star reviews, then, and especially I don't have a ton right now. I think I have 45 right now. Um, but if it was like all five star reviews, it kind of looks a little suspicious. Like, oh, you know, maybe her friends just did this. So it makes me look like a legit author and like a legit product. So I was super excited about that. I'd love to hear from you guys. Let me know what book you want to write. Have a great day. Bye.